Yaristan's third letter. Dear Sophia, your letter was comradely, and I'll try to answer in the same spirit, but I don't agree with you. You make the statement, our project was not to excommunicate, but to communicate. This is a bad joke. I'll try to show you that our project was to excommunicate, not to communicate. I read your letter several times. Myrna read it. She's still convinced you're the ogre who caused my arrest, but she now considers you a rather pleasant ogre. She even expressed a desire to get together with you and Sabina, if circumstances should ever allow such a meeting. But she thought the passages where you glorify your past experience must have been taken from the speeches of our politicians. Myrna and I were stunned to learn certain facts from your letter. I was amazed to learn that George Alberts had not been arrested at the time when you, Louisa, and the rest of us were arrested. I also think it curious that you and Louisa were released after spending only two days in jail. I spent four years there, and as far as I know, very few of us were sentenced to, to shorter terms than that. The reason I was amazed Alberts hadn't been arrested is because I had always thought he'd been arrested before any of the rest of us. I had thought Claude's suspicion of him, a part of an official campaign designated to prepare Alberts' friends and acquaintances for his arrest. Such campaigns to stigmatize an individual as a suspicious character normally originated high up in the political hierarchy and were passed down to susceptible people, like Claude. An instruction was thus transformed into a widely circulated rumor. The rumor gradually became a widely held certainty, and in time all the victim's friends acquiesced in his temporary or permanent liquidation, frequently feeling relieved to be rid of such a dangerous acquaintance. The fact that Alberts wasn't arrested suggests that the suspicion was not an instruction from the top, but originated with Claude. Since Claude had never had personal contact with Alberts, he must have been pointing his finger at Louisa, or else at Titus Zabrin or me, since we were Louisa's closest friends and, therefore, by extension, Alberts' friends. Claude's act must have been a classical political move. He was incriminating one or all three of us in order to establish his power over the rest. His success against us would be a permanent threat he could hold over the others, and his position as gang leader would be assured by his power to eliminate real or potential opponents. This wouldn't mean that Claude Tamnich was any less of a gorilla than I had remembered him to be, but it would mean that he was considerably more intelligent. Another reason I'm amazed to learn that Alberts wasn't arrested is because this conflicts with an event you mentioned in your first letter, namely with the fact that he was fired from his job. I had known about his expulsion at the time and had assumed that this had been the first step towards his arrest and imprisonment. I'd assumed he had been arrested for exactly the same reason we were. I had thought his firing had been something like a forecast of our arrest. He was accused of sabotage, of being a foreign agent, and of representing a danger to society's productive forces. I know he wasn't the cause of our arrest, but I was sure he had been arrested. Are you sure about this? I'm not asking to catch you in another slip of memory, but to clarify my understanding. Since Titus Zebran as well as Louisa had long been his comrades, I had assumed his activity had been similar to Louisa's, at least before he immigrated, and that, consequently, he had been arrested for the same reason. The detail that upset Myrna concerned your letter that you sent me twelve years ago. You make me feel I should apologize for bringing this up again. Before mentioning what bothered Myrna, I should make it clear that I don't consider either you or Louisa personally responsible for my arrest or imprisonment. You apparently read my critique of our shared past activity as a critique of you and Louisa, and you understood Myrna's suspicions about your letter to be a part of that critique. My critique is primarily a reevaluation of my own past and has nothing to do with Myrna's suspicions. I told you I didn't consider that letter responsible for my arrest, and I didn't make the absurd suggestion that you sent instructions to the police. At the time of my second arrest, thousands of people were imprisoned. They were accused of engaging in acts hostile to the state. I was arrested because of the activities in which Jan Sedlak and I and several other comrades were engaged at the time. The arrival of your letter happened to coincide with a vast uprising that broke out in Magarna, an uprising which had numerous echoes here. Jan and I were among those echoes. All the echoes were suppressed. Myrna saw a causal connection where there was nothing more than a pure coincidence. Yet my mention of Myrna's erroneous conclusion led you to think I was accusing you indirectly, backhandedly. Such an understanding of my letter makes it difficult for me to deal with Myrna's response to your most recent letter. Myrna was upset when she learned that the messenger who delivered your letter was arrested. This information confirms her belief that your letter was the cause of my arrest. Her belief remains groundless, but your friend's arrest does pose another question. What was he doing here besides delivering your letter? Why was he's so important to the police. 
Did they think your letter was an important document, or was he delivering something else besides? You didn't believe your friend's account of the experiences to which he was subjected in prison. You very honestly admitted you couldn't believe a, wor a world we had helped build could have degenerated into such a primitive torture chamber. I don't know what he told you, but I know that some of the experiences I have undergone are difficult to put into words. I suspect that your greatest injustice to him was to think he was lying. The fate of your letter illustrates a point I'm trying to make. What is the relation between the intentions of our acts and the significance our acts have to others? How do others understand and respond to our words and gestures? Myrna's response to your letter illustrates that this relationship is not as clear and obvious as you make it seem. Living in a world where arrests are frequent, where news is rarely good, where the outcome of unusual events is not anticipated with joy, but with fear, Myrna saw your letter as an omen. For Myrna, that letter could only have been a threat or a summons. Those were the only types of messages she had ever received. My point isn't to suggest that Myrna is right in thinking your earlier letter the cause of my arrest. My point is to understand what her attitude to your letter means. What you exclude from your analysis is the actual context in which our acts take place. When you wrote that letter 12 years ago, your intention was to communicate about experiences we had shared. This was the content of your letter. Yet to Myrna, that letter was an omen. It was an object which had nothing in common with your intentions. Myrna was wrong, but let's imagine that she was right, that your letter did have something to do with my arrest. In that case, your letter would have been precisely the object Myrna saw and not the communication you had intended. In that case, there would have been a great discrepancy between your intention to communicate and the significance of your gesture to cause my arrest. After my first release from prison, my outlook was very similar to your present outlook. Much of what I experienced during that four-year term should have changed that outlook, but failed to do so until many years later. Like you, I treated my past, my experience with you, and my understanding of Luis's experience as a standard of comparison, as a stark contrast to the world in which I was released. The four years in prison only strengthened my desire to communicate this experience to others. Like you, I wanted to bring my earlier experience back to life. I looked for comrades with whom to resume the same struggle. Like you, I didn't want to become a blind tool of the world that surrounded me. I saw through that world. I saw it as a cage, because I had experience an outside, a utopia, because I had struggled together with others to realize a different world. This was my outlook when I embraced Myrna and her parents. I saw them as common people, as typical examples of the broadest sector of the working population. I was convinced that if I could communicate my project to these few people, they would themselves communicate it to all those like them, and the revolutionary project would spread like a tidal wave. I was convinced that in time Myrna's father would translate into his own language his understanding that the constraints and the deadening routine were not imposed by nature, like the cycle of planting and harvesting, but were socially imposed largely because he and his likes consented daily to reproduce the constraint and the routine. I was sure he'd find his own words for expressing his understanding, that he and his likes had the ability to end the infernal routine, and the ability to project and build an altogether different world. I was also convinced that Myrna would easily grasp that marriage. Childbirth and housekeeping were not her lot, though those, those activities couldn't continue if she and her likes didn't submit to them. I was convinced that as soon as she translated this understanding into her own words, she would communicate it to others like her, and a new field of possibilities would open up. When Jan still lived at the Sedlak house, I sensed a certain hostility towards my arguments. Though I knew he agreed with me, he never supported me. Once, after a long argument, the subject of which I'd forgotten, he told me he had never realized how much of a missionary I was. He treated my arguments as attempts to convert his family to a religion. I didn't try to understand his attitude. Later, when he and I worked together, I didn't draw any conclusions from the blatant difference between his behavior and mine. Like your friend Ron, he flouted authority, didn't submit to discipline, avoided work whenever possible, and stole as much as he could. Also like Ron, and unlike you and me, he didn't argue. He didn't try to convert anyone to his utopia. He made no attempt to communicate his past experiences to others. I didn't learn the significance of Jan's hostility until several years later, when it had long been too late to let him know I finally understood what he had tried to tell me. My activity during those heated after-dinner arguments was not communication. It was missionary activity. It was exactly the type of activity that takes place in that school you described. It couldn't generate a community, but only destroy it. I acted towards my hosts and future relatives as a priest, a professor, a pedagogue, 
My mind had transformed my past experiences into revelations of truth, and I professed this truth in order to convert Myrna, her father, and if possible, even her mother. I had convinced myself that as soon as I communicated this truth from my head to theirs, they would spread it further. Every evening after dinner, I launched into a tirade against one or another type of sold activity, usually bus driving. What Myrna's father heard was a tirade, a lecture, referred only marginally to his own activity as a bus driver, and which had nothing at all to do with rebellion or insurrection. He knew people who rebelled in various ways. Some came to work drunk, others damaged or wrecked buses, yet others used their buses on weekends for family outings. He may have sympathized with all of them, and he understood they were all rebels in some sense. I clearly wasn't like them. My discourses on the need to abolish vehicles were not rebellion, but pedagogy. Professors of insurrection are not insurgents. Later in this letter, I'll try to describe what I think they are. Most people know this. For example, when Myrna read your letter, she remarked that your friend Ron reminded her of her brother. Ron rejected wage labor, private property, education, and his family through concrete acts. He fought against these institutions in his daily practice. Ron was an insurgent, whereas you and Louisa are pedagogues, missionaries. You recognize the contradictory nature of such pedagogy in your description of your academic friend, Damon, but you don't seem to recognize it in Louisa or in yourself. To Myrna's father, I was neither a drunkard, nor a thief, nor much of a rebel. I went to work on time, drove the scheduled route, didn't get drunk, and never tried to borrow the bus. Sedlak had no trouble at all understanding what I was in his world, a political pedagogue. In his world, such people were not bus drivers, but politicians. He recognized me, not because of my birth or my social function, but because of my behavior. He knew that in his world, political professors didn't long remain peasants or bus drivers. They were eventually transferred to the rungs on the ladders of union bureaucracies or government bureaucracies. When I tried to communicate my intentions, he only heard me express the aspirations of a politician. All he saw in my gestures was the ability to satisfy such aspirations and he related to me in terms of the way he saw me, not in terms of the projects and possibilities I thought I was communicating to him. I've already told you that he was very enthusiastic about my marriage to Myrna. His enthusiasm can't be explained by the fact that he liked me, nor by the fact that he had fallen in love with my dreams and hopes, my projects, my past experiences. He was a generous and warm person, but he was also shrewd, calculating, and observant. The years of bus driving hadn't deprived him of the peasant's ability to orient himself to the village market. He could still sense the precise moment when the price of his commodity rose. He still knew which buyers were willing to pay the highest price. He hadn't lost the commercial instincts of peasants whose productive activity is oriented to the market. He was also aware that politicians had become the diamonds and, ca and caviar on the market of human commodities. My attempts to communicate with him had merely informed him that I was a commodity of this type. His enthusiasm for the marriage was motivated by a combination of traditional and commercial consider considerations. Traditionally, the husband or wife of a villager had to be strong and healthy. The same standard was applied to co cows and horses. A sick cow or a weak horse would constitute a burden. What was desired was an animal that would contribute to the maintenance of the peasant household and would assure the survival of the parents in old age. Sedlak applied this standard in the conditions of the society in which he found himself. The husband still had to be healthy and strong, but these requirements lost their physical meaning and referred to commercial qualities. Thus healthy became equivalent to marketable, namely the quality of being useful to specific potential buyers. He had to be strong, not physically, but commercially, in the quantitative sense of commanding a high price, as opposed to a weak, ordinary commodity, the low co quality of which is proved by its low price. Consequently, for Sedlak, the marriage was a shrewd commercial transaction. He sold his daughter in exchange for an anticipated future which would more than recompense his original investment. He made only one mistake in his calculations, and considering the limits of his knowledge of the market, his error was really very minor. His main estimates were all precise. The conditions of the market were exactly those he surmised. Today's buyers do in fact pay more for politicians than for any other human commodity. Our century is, after all, the golden age of the political racketeer. And thanks to Louisa, I was in fact a commodity of that genus. His only miscalculation was caused by his lack of familiarity with the specific commodity in question. If apples had been in question, he would have known that only certain types of apples were selling for an exaggeratedly high price, and he wouldn't have erred by bringing in the wrong apples to the market. But he wasn't as familiar with politicians as with apples. He didn't grasp the subtle difference between politicians. 
He didn't even know there were such differences. To him, all politicians were the same. He lacked the system of classification of this commodity. This is what caused him to err. He mistakenly placed his expectations on a commodity of the right class, even the right genus, but the wrong species. He never understood his error. My words didn't inform Sadlack about my past experiences, or my hopes, or my determination to struggle for a different world. They informed him about the characteristics and the potential selling price of a commodity. I thought that by communicating those experiences and by formulating those arguments, I was ceasing to be a tool of my environment, a mere object in a world of objects. Yet the end result of my activity was a complete inversion of my intentions. I succeeded only in defining myself as a specific type of object. My point isn't to expose a peasant's motives or idiosyncrasies, but to understand what happened to the hopes and projects I once shared with you when I tried to communicate them to other human beings. How did others perceive me, my project, and my past experience? Was Sadlack's perception of me distorted, or was it my self-perception that was distorted? He recognized the pedagogue behind the speechmaker, the politician behind the pedagogue, and the repressive machinery of the state behind the politician. He recognized the political rhetoric as the main attribute of today's rulers. It was I who didn't understand the nature of my activity. I only understood it in terms of my intentions, as you still do today. At that time, I shared your present commitment. That's why you're right when you compare my release after my first prison term with your experience after you emigrated. Both of us lacked and tried to reconstitute the project we had shared. I saw the Sedlex as people with whom I could share that project. You saw Ron as such a person. But you failed to learn from Ron what I eventually learned from the Sedlax, that I wasn't one of them, but one of the pedagogues, that my teaching wasn't distinguishable from the one that had created their repressive world, that this pedagogy was nothing more than a series of rationalizations which justified the rule of pedagogues over the rest of society. When Myrna's father saw a politician behind the pedagogue, he wasn't exhibiting his ignorance, but rather his acute powers of observation. He saw my dreams as illusions and linked my gestures to the repressive acts of the ruling order. It was he who exposed the nature of your and my past experience, not because he was a social philosopher or critic, but because he had a fairly lucid awareness of the world he inhabited, and because, like a prisoner in a crowded cell, he tried to accommodate himself as well as possible without causing discomfort to others and without dehumanizing himself. The commitment I once shared with you rebounded from the world and hit me in the face. At some point, I had to examine that commitment. When I found that my past experiences, as well as my attempts to communicate it, were flawed, I began to reject them. I considered it highly significant that teaching happens to be the branch of activity in which you've engaged yourself. I'm sorry if I seem intentionally cruel. I know from your description of your life's activities and from your attachment to experiences I've been rejecting that you're offended by my present attitudes. When I read your first letter, I recognized you far too well. I realized it was I who had changed. I had re-examined and rejected the qualities you had maintained. That's why I responded to your letter with a certain amount of anger. I wasn't responding to you, but to myself and my own recent past, to attributes I had only recently wrestled with and rejected in myself. If you thought my attacks were aimed specifically at you, then you misunderstood me. They were aimed at a past which I share with most of my contemporaries. Today I am one among hundreds, maybe thousands, who are rejecting and uprooting and exposing that past. Contrary to what you say repeatedly in your last letter, the ferment surrounding me today is not a continuation of any project you and I took part in. All around me, in factories and schools and on the streets, my contemporaries are turning their backs to the experience you celebrate in your letters, and also to the dreams you and I once shared. A few days ago, I visited the plant where you and I had found my first job, where I had met Titus and Louisa and you. The last time I had been there was 15 years ago, after my first release. Your letters and my attempts to remember and describe the plant stimulated me to see it again. I also had a vague desire to find out what happened to the people who have played such a significant part in your life. I was stunned by what I saw there, although I should have expected it. Zagad's name has now been removed from the front of the building, from all the windows and from the cartons. It has been replaced by the word popular. And hardly anything else in the plant has changed in more than 20 years. In fact, it is now more similar to the place I once worked than to the plant I visited after my first release. The machinery seemed greased and oiled. Everything seemed to be in working order. On the other hand, the building is deteriorating. The walls haven't been painted for at least a quarter of a century. The workspace is even dirtier than it had been 15 years ago, and the printing on the cartons is of even lower quality. The red posters on the walls, with their messages celebrating the glorious victory of the working class, are covered with grime.
The first major change that took place there during the past 20 years was taking place before my own eyes. The workers were on strike. It's the first strike there in 20 years. It started a week ago. Everything about this strike glaringly demonstrates that it has nothing in common with the last strike that broke out in that plant, the one you and I took part in. And everyone in the plant was aware of this. I didn't even have to ask questions. As soon as I introduced myself as someone who had worked there once and had been in prison for sabotage, everyone started talking at once. What everyone expressed most clearly and unmistakably was relief. It's over. The terror is over. It's as if a war or a plague had suddenly come to an end. Various workers told me that for weeks they had been skeptical and cautious. They had read about the attempted coup by the president and the army and about the suspension of the police, but they didn't discuss these events. They listened to the speeches of politicians, at first only on their radios at home. Later a worker brought a radio to work and they listened all day. They started to talk about the speeches, but they didn't act. They were suspicious. They thought the whole sequence might be nothing more than a performance conducted by those on top, an intermission between two acts, a change of guard, a mere replacement of one repressive group by another group, with different names and slogans, but equally repressive. Then they began to hear of outbreaks of strikes in other plants, oustings of police agents, managers, and union representatives. They learned that the workers who took part in these acts weren't arrested, imprisoned, or even fired. At that point, they stopped discussing the speeches on the radio and started talking about their plant. The decision to strike grew out of those discussions. It was the collective decision of the workers in the plant. It wasn't a decision taken by politicians and transmitted to the workers by union representatives or any other agents of those in power. In fact, the purpose of the strike was to oust the union representative. They won this demand immediately. The official left his post as soon as the strike broke out. But the workers remained on strike. They worked out a scheme for replacing the union representative. They wanted the, the post to rotate among all the workers in the plant in alphabetical order. Each worker was to occupy the post for a month. The manager insisted on a permanent and appointed union representative. The workers abandoned their initial scheme and insisted only on the right to elect a permanent representative, a demand the manager is ready to grant. I asked them why they gave up their demand and why they didn't oust the manager along with the union representative. Various workers explained that the present manager is a pliant and mediocre bureaucrat who performs his functions reluctantly and obeys instructions like everyone else, whereas the previous union representative had been the real power behind the management and the most feared and hated individual in the plant. The union representative was a member of the political police, and his actual function was that of prison warden. As soon as he was ousted, all the minor police agents among the workers quietly disappeared. Thus the removal of this single functionary clears the air and creates an atmosphere of freedom never before experienced by most of the workers in the plant. I was told that all the other steps they might take were minor by comparison. Now that they've recovered their ability to act and remove their main fetter, they'll wait and see what other steps the situation makes possible. Behind this realism, I sensed a certain amount of fear. Despite their apprehension and their caution, these workers are not the puppets we were. This time the project is genuinely their own. I don't want to exaggerate the importance of what they've done so far. Strikes initiated by workers have been nearly impossible here for 20 years, but such strikes are not a new discovery, nor is the ousting of a union representative a novelty. All I want to emphasize is the difference between this event and the one you and I experienced. The forces in play are almost identical. A group of politicians is jockeying for positions of power. The politicians' journalistic admirers are designing halos and crowns for their patrons, hysterically trying to stimulate displays of reverence for one or another clique of racketeers. Professors and union bureaucrats are flying from one plant to another, frantically and pathetically seeking applause for one or another bureaucratic panacea. Each political group is trying to plant its agents among the workers. Each group is trying to stimulate workers to demonstrate support for one or another part of its program. But unlike 20 years ago, the politicians aren't succeeding. The speeches are cheered and ignored. Workers invite speakers, praise them, applaud them, and then discuss the next steps to be taken with each other. The steps they take are almost always diametrically opposed to those advocated by the speechmaker they applauded. The workers I saw in the plant weren't carrying out the directives of officials, but exploring and carrying out their own desires. I sensed a feeling of solidarity I hadn't felt for 20 years. It was a solidarity cemented by mutual aid instead of mutual suspicion. And this group of people welcomed me. Unlike my experience 15 years ago, when the union bureaucrat told me he couldn't afford to hire a convicted saboteur, these workers invited me to join them before I even asked. Several people asked me if I had another job, and since I didn't, they urged me to come back. Several openings had been created by the sudden resignation of the police agents who fled when their chief was ousted, fearing the other workers' revenge.
I told them I'd think about it, and they said they'd reserve a place for me. The very possibility of such an invitation is probably the greatest change in the plant's history. I wasn't being hired, but invited. The difference in words alone indicates that a profound change is underway. One is hired to a job. I was being invited to take part in an experience whose content is yet unknown. And the people inviting me were neither owners, nor managers, nor union bureaucrats, but workers. They were inviting me to join them in an activity which was about to be transformed from a deadening routine to a project, although no one as yet knew just how it was to be transformed. What I saw, heard, and felt amounted to a complete rejection of your and my past experience. I'm sorry if this sounds cruel or callous. You sound even more callous to me when you described our past activity as a project in which the whole population raised itself out of submission. Such a description is a travesty of the real event. Your description refers to the moment when the whole population immersed itself in unprecedented submission. The population is raising itself out of that submission only now, scarred and weakened after 20 years of bending, but not defeated. What these workers are finally questioning is everything that was imposed on them 20 years ago, everything except the function of the plan itself, which Jan Sedlak and your friend Ron would have questioned, but not you or I or Louisa. They've discussed everything except the nature of their activity, an activity in which people sell their lives so as to package other people's sold lives, an activity that epitomizes the cannibalism of the commercial monstrosity that nourishes itself on human lives. I have no idea whether or not these workers are going to storm that fortress. If they do, you and I will not have contributed to that struggle with our slogans about workers administrating and managing their own factories. Before I left the plant, I asked the workers if any of them might know what happened to our former comrades. Several people had heard of three of our friends, but they were all surprised to learn our comrades had once worked at the plant. You will surely be more surprised by what I learned than I was. The dreamer, according to you, a worker like all the rest, Mark Glavney, is one of the more important bureaucrats in the state apparatus. He has been on the Central Committee of the State Planning Commission for several years. They found my ignorance more surprising than I found the news. I had to admit I had never looked in the newspapers. They were even more surprised when I asked about Adrian Pavershan. Don't you listen to the radio either? one person asked. I do listen to the radio occasionally, but apparently I'm not very attentive. Our friend Adrian, to whom you say the spirit of liberation once spread, gives frequent speeches over the radio and is a well-known politician of the new type, I was told. Like old Sadlak, I can no longer distinguish between politicians. One woman also knew Jasna Zabroka, and this surprised me a great deal more, not because Jasna has become rich and famous too, but because she teaches in Yara's school and lives in my neighborhood. I could have asked Yara about her. Jasna could just as well have asked Yara about me. I rushed to the school as soon as I left the plant. When Yara came out of school, she thought I'd come to walk her home and was pleased, since I had never done that before. I told her I had just learned an old friend of mine taught in her school. Do I know her? Yara asked. I suppose so, I answered. It's Jasna's Broca. Oh, not her, Yara said, intensely disappointed. She was the last one to join us. She stayed out of every demonstration except the last, and she came out only a week ago, only because it became fashionable. I saw Jasna come out of the school while Yara was still speaking, and I didn't have time to respond to Yara's perfect description. I would have told her, yes, that's the one, that's exactly the person I knew. Jasna looked 20 years older. I don't think I would have recognized her if I hadn't been looking for her. She seemed embarrassed to see both of us. She greeted Yara politely. Then she ran to embrace me and burst out crying. With a voice muffled by sobs, she said, Thank God it's finally over. Letting me go, she embraced Yara and told her, and thank you for being the most mature and most courageous of all of us. Jasna began to apologize profusely to Yara and to me, although neither of us had said anything. She admitted having known for years that Yara was my daughter. She apologized for never having told Yara that she knew me. She had known when I was to be released and that I was home. I wanted very badly to come to see you, she told me. Turning to Yara, she continued, just as I wanted very badly to take part in the first two demonstrations. But I stayed away. I was afraid. I was in prison, too. Not as long as Yarostan, but long enough to have filled the rest of my life with fear of being arrested. I told Jasna about my correspondence with you, and asked if she remembered you and Louisa and Sabina. I could no more forget them than I could forget you, she said. It's because I remember all of you that I began to hate myself for my fear and cowardice, for staying away from the students and the demonstrations. I felt I was betraying not only the students, but everything and everyone I loved. I asked if she was still afraid to visit our house. If you hadn't come today, I would have come to see you, she answered. The spell broke a week ago. I'm no longer afraid. 
What kept me from coming yesterday or the day before was no longer fear of arrest, but embarrassment. I couldn't face your brave Yara. I was ashamed of being such a coward. Yara reached for the teacher's hand and held it in her own. She had apparently become convinced she had misjudged our comrade. That fear is so irrational, so senseless, and yet it holds you as if you were locked into a box, Jasna explained. But as soon as I took part in that demonstration a week ago, the fear vanished, as if I had suddenly left the box. It was wonderful, just like old times. To find out if she was really saying what you've been saying in your letters, I asked her, just exactly like old times? The same Jasna whom you and I remembered answered, no. It wasn't really like the old times at all. This was completely different. These kids have far more courage than I ever had. I never did anything unless I thought everyone else was going to do the same thing. The kids began completely on their own, when no one was on their side, when they didn't know what would happen to them, when all the officials and teachers were against them, and Yara was among the first. I asked Jasna if she ever saw any of the people you and I had known. She said she had seen Titus Zabran regularly over the years. She also knew something about all the others and promised to tell me about them when she visits us. All she said about them was, they're all doing better than I am. That evening I told Myrna about my visit to the plant and about Jasna. I decided to accept the worker's generous invitation and go back to work in the carton plant. I asked Myrna if she would quit her job when I started working. She said she wouldn't dream of it. When I spoke to Myrna about my intense desire to visit the recently formed political prisoners club, she again said that such a visit would only cause more trouble than it could possibly be worth. However, when I mentioned Jasna's reluctance to visit us and that the reason for her reluctance, Myrna said, It's one thing to be afraid to take part in a demonstration. If Yara had asked for my permission, I'd never have given it to her. But it's terrible to be afraid to visit old friends. She was my brother's friend. She should have come to see me long before you were released. Don't you see I have as much a reason to visit the prisoners club, I asked. My concern wasn't to have her permission, but to calm her fears. Myrna was once as reckless and adventurous as Yara. Two decades of, quote, paradise have made her fearful, cautious, and resigned. I went to the prisoners' club the following day. I had the impression I was visiting the underworld of the ancient Greeks, the place where people went after they died. Everyone in the room turned to look at every newcomer. On every face there was the same question, Is this another ghost of a former friend? Newcomers continually shouted with glee as they recognized their former friends. It was very moving. Men and women, mostly older than I, continually called out the names of people they suddenly recognized. People who had met in prison wept. People who hadn't seen each other for twenty years embraced. Each thought the other had long been dead. But it wasn't Hades. The people I saw were very much alive. They all expressed the same sense of relief I had felt everywhere else. It's finally over. These people were not spirits meeting in the underworld, but living beings dancing on a tomb. The tomb contains what you call our project. These people are the last emerging from that project's spell, ridding themselves of its power. You are among the last who are still in a trance. I didn't long remain an outsider observing a ceremony, but quickly became one of the celebrants. Yarostan, someone shouted, someone I didn't recognize. He was a gray-haired man who looked over sixty. When he embraced me and shook me to make sure I was alive, I was overwhelmed. Zedek Tabarkin, I shouted. I fir first met this one-time union organizer during my first prison term. I thought he was much older than I am. He's aged terribly. He briefly told me about his experiences after his release. They were quite different from mine. He was released a few months after my first release. He too was turned down by a union bureaucrat when he tried to get his former job back. But many workers at his plant remembered him. They threatened to strike if he wasn't reinstated. What happened then was almost unheard of in those days. The workers won. Zedanik was re rehired. He told me that he then spent several weeks trying to locate me. He even asked a friend to do research in Union Files. He laughed when I told him I had become Moran Sedlak, a newly arrived peasant. I've been shuffling from home to work and back again. The only extraordinary thing I've done over these years was to come to the prisoners' club, he told me. It's not the prisons that have to be exposed. Wherever there are prisons, they're going to be the same. What has to be exposed is the activity that led workers to put up with the imprisonment of their comrades, to accept without struggle the complete destruction of their rights and the constant police surveillance. I asked him what forms those exposures might take, and he said, I don't know, but I do know it will be the most useful work I've ever done in my life. My views had been similar to Zenex when we first met. I was intensely happy to learn he had undergone a similar change as I, and that we again had a similar outlook. He's as convinced as I am that the type of activity to which we were committed when we first met lies at the root of the relations which have shackled us.
This activity is precisely the experience which for you has become a standard by which you judge your present practice. You've intoxicated yourself with that experience, and you're offended by my attempt to understand its nature. But if we refuse to see where it led us, we can hardly avoid reproducing the same outcome over and over again. If we're to avoid that outcome, we should confront the elements that led to it, expose them, uproot them, and bury them. Please understand that I'm not devising an argument to throw at you or Louisa. I'm trying to describe a process in which not only Zdenek, but most of the people around me are engaged. This process is an extensive examination of the roots of our submission. If I find that my own past activity is one of those roots, then I have to expose that activity along with all the other roots. I first met Zdenek in prison about a year after you and I were arrested. Halfway through a meal, I started listening to a discussion taking place at the other end of the table. Someone said that before the war, the union had fought for workers' interests and secured the workers' share of the social output. Another person said unions had always been pliant instruments of the hands of the most influential sections of the ruling class, and that our newly installed state-run unions were different only in degree, but not in kind, from all other unions. A third person, this was Zednik, argued that the pre-war, as well as the post-coup unions, were not workers' unions at all, but capitalist organizations within the working class. He said a genuine union was an instrument for the appropriation of society's productive forces by the workers. An organization which consisted of racketeers who enriched themselves by selling labor power and assisted the police in disciplining workers was not a genuine union. In Zenenek's argument, I recognized what I had learned from Louisa, and I looked for opportunities to talk to him. For several months, Zenenek and I talked continually during exercise sessions and during meals. He was fascinated by my accounts of Luisa's experiences. In my descriptions of those events, he saw a reflection of his own activities as a union organizer. Zdenek had been active in union politics, in the same plant where he still works today, already before the war. During the war, he had been a member of a resistance organization. After the war, he was appointed to a minor union post. He never tired of explaining to me that, although he identified with the union bureaucracy at the time, he took his function seriously only with respect to the workers' demands, and fought to increase wages and improve safety standards and working conditions. He didn't take seriously the directives that came from the top regarding his work discipline and productivity. His first major political engagement coincided with yours and mine, but unlike you and me, Zdenek was a member of the union bureaucracy. He took seriously the state propaganda about dangerous reactionary circles who had threatened to deprive workers of their rights and institute a repressive military regime. He engaged himself in the official struggle to neutralize those reactionary circles by mobilizing the workers to demonstrate and strike. He knew that workers did not initiate the strikes and demonstrations since the initiatives were instructions handed down to him by union officials. But he didn't question his role. He was convinced that the threat had to be removed and that the strikes and demonstrations were appropriate responses to it. Zeninek initiated the strike at his plant, called for the expulsion of the manager, and personally accompanied the, gal the delegation that carried out the expulsion. Although he had become critical by the time he told me about these events, he communicated the enthusiasm he had felt at the time they had taken place. He attended the Congress of Works Councils as the official delegate for his plant. Hundreds of delegates arrived, I remember him telling me. We decided to declare a general strike, and only ten votes were recorded against it. Although I don't remember his descriptions word for word, his summary of his experience was very similar to yours. He considered this the greatest event of his life. The event released a surge of contentment, enthusiasm, and initiative throughout the working population. At last we were going to run our own affairs. At last the people were masters. Nobody would be able to exploit our efforts for their own ends. Nobody would be able to deceive us, sell us to our enemies, or betray us. He remained enthusiastic when, at least in appearance, armed workers occupied radio stations, post and telegraph offices, railway stations. When action committees and workers' militias sprang up in every factory, in every public institution, he thought the workers' community had been born. Zdenek didn't begin to have doubts until he was ousted from his union post. A new plant council was appointed, and he was excluded from it. Zdenek himself hadn't been elected either, but had been appointed by resistance politicians, and he had never questioned his own right to the post he occupied. As he narrated this, he was bitter about the fact that he became critical of his own usurpation only after he was himself usurped. Zdenek was excluded because a temporary trade union council had appointed itself as an organ higher than the plant council. This temporary body consisted exclusively of workers who had been members of one organization, the government party. The temporary body then proceeded to appoint a new plant council, consisting of workers who were members of the same party, or who were at least enthusiastic sympathizers. Zdenek was popular among workers for his consistent defense of their interests as workers, but he was known as a critic of the government party.
The newly appointed plant council then proceeded to elect a new trade union council and voted back the very individuals who had previously appointed the plant council. By this maneuver, the status of the trade union council was legitimized as an organ higher than the plant council and therefore empowered to appoint the members of the plant council. Zdenek set out a lone campaign to expose these machinations, but his exposures had no effect. Workers who knew him merely winked knowingly and reminded him that he hadn't made such critiques when he had been a creature of self-appointed politicians. He had known about these things all along, but hadn't con concentrated on them during the years when he him himself had been a part of the machinery. By the time I met him, he couldn't say enough about the spurious nature of the workers' victory or the orchestrated character of the strikes and demonstrations. It was from Zdenek that I learned that the initiatives in those events didn't come from the workers themselves, that the enthusiasm was artificially stimulated by seasoned bureaucrats, that instructions were skillfully transmitted from the top of the political hierarchy to the rank and file. In my last letter, I tried to summarize what I learned from Zdenek, but your response to my description of the puppets and puppeteers makes me aware that I failed to communicate what I learned. Zdenek's descriptions were filled with vivid details, having himself played a role in stimulating the artificial enthusiasm he was intimately familiar with, the ways in which this was done. He knew perfectly well how the decisions to demonstrate and to strike had been reached. I still remember every detail of one of his descriptions. Several days before a scheduled union meeting, he was informed by the local secretary of the government party that on the day of the union meeting, several plants were going to proclaim themselves on strike in opposition to the machinations of reactionary circles. Since Zdenek was glad to learn this, seeing it as an appropriate response to a real threat, on the day of the meeting, he was the first to speak in favor of proclaiming the strike. Three or four others immediately followed with speeches in favor of the strike, and a couple of minutes after the last speech, the decision to go on strike was unanimously acclaimed. The decision which had been transmitted to Zednik by the secretary of the local organization had been transmitted by the same secretary to the three others who spoke in favor of it. The decision had obviously been transmitted to the local secretary by the regional secretary, since otherwise the local secretary couldn't have known ahead of time that several other plants were going to make identical decisions on the same day. When the strike broke out and almost all plants were on strike when the day began, it became clear that not a single one of these strikes was a spontaneous gesture of solidarity it became obvious that the decision to strike had originated yet higher, that it was the decision of a general secretary of the organization, who was at that time jockeying for the post of prime minister. The decision had originated at the peak of the state apparatus, and by transmitting it, Zednik had been a state agent. Only after he was arrested did Zednik realize that all the demonstrations and strikes, all the shows of force by armed workers, had a similar origin. Only then did he lose his enthusiasm for the events that had taken place. The plant militias and action committees, which he had earlier seen as detachments of armed workers spontaneously created by the workers as organs of struggle and self-defense, were composed exclusively of workers who had long been members of the same organization that ousted him from his post. In jail, he realized that the members of this organization had succeeded in becoming the only armed body in every factory and public institution. Since the police was, by then, under the command of the same organization, the role of the action committees, militias, and other groups of armed workers was to act as an adjunct to the police. He realized that the entire movement of armed workers had not constituted a workers' community, but a gigantic police network, that whole sections of the working class had been recruited to do police work, that under the banner of the self-liberation of the working class, workers had attacked and arrested other workers. What Zednik realized was that he had played his part, not in a victory of the workers' movement, but in its complete defeat. What pained him even more was the realization that this defeat had annihilated everything the workers had won during all the earlier decades of struggle. Militant workers who had fought for workers' demands were all jailed. Workers lost the right to strike. The possibility of forming independent workers' organizations was destroyed. Although Zednik had helped inflict this defeat as a member of the union apparatus, at the time of our discussions he still didn't grasp the role his activity as union organizer had played in this defeat. His outlook was identical to the position Luisa still expresses today. He blamed himself only marginally and only for his blindness. He blamed external elements for the defeat. He argued that the workers' real union had been transformed into a sham union, that the real workers' movement had been replaced by a simulated workers' movement, which in fact consisted of politicians and bureaucrats. The politicians had infiltrated the workers' union and destroyed it from within. They had taken over and then derailed the real workers' movement. Zednik felt that he and the rest of the workers had been betrayed. Instead of taking over the plants and running them on their own, the workers had replaced a Zagad only to find themselves bossed by a Genghis Khan. They had averted the military and police dictatorship 
which was to be carried out by reactionary circles, that later turned out to have been pure inventions of propagandists, and found themselves surrounded by the military and the police, by an immensely enlarged police which included former friends, fellow workers, relatives, and neighbors in its ranks. Throughout his prison term, Zednik remained convinced that the real workers' movement was still alive, that workers could still revitalize the Union, that all they had to do was to oust the alien elements that had infiltrated it. At the end of his term, he was as much of a missionary as I was. He left prison with the enthusiasm of the first Union organizers. His mission was to expose what the workers didn't know, that they had been duped, that agents of the state and racketeers had taken over their Union and made it serve their own ends. He was as convinced as you and Louisa that his past experiences, intentions, and hopes were an adequate basis for his relations with others. His aim was to return to the struggle as it had been before these external forces derailed it from its real course and temporarily defeated it. Zednik was always bitter about the fact that he didn't begin, begin to re-examine his past until after he lost his union post. Even when I talked to him only a few days ago, he insisted he would still be a trade union bureaucrat today if he hadn't been ousted 20 years ago, and that he wouldn't have developed any critical insights if he had continued to carry out his official function. He admits he would sooner or later have been removed from the apparatus because he would have continued to use his position to further workers' interests whenever this could be done. But he says that if the apparatus had been flexible enough to allow him to do only that, he would never have turned against it on his own.